Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. So you can make your way there. And uh, then I have some, if you have the outline, you can kind of see the direction we're going in tonight. A couple of comments in our, in our opening portion, portion here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there we go. That um, I want to show, I want to read you some statistics uh, that we recently received, and it's uh, talking about, of course, and this is a, it, from the secular standpoint, that there's been a sharp drop in the number of American Christians in the last seven years, from 78 percent of our population to 71 percent, mainly because the millennials, which are those that have been born either right at the a few years they were babies in the last part of the last century, and they're now growing up, and they're teenagers, and they're 10, and 11, 12, 13 years old, and, and a little bit older, because we're in 2015 now, and so they're at least, you know, around 15 years of age, and not interested in church anymore. Come on, somebody. A drop of 7%. Now, how many of you understand that's millions of people? I mean, that's not a small number. 7% sounds small if you're looking at it without a comparison, but when you're comparing it to over 300 million, come on, that's a lot of people. It goes on to say that in, in also in that time frame that only, 50, only 56%, and that number is dropping considerably, only 56% consider themselves as Christians. In other words, they don't know who they are. They consider themselves as that because they really don't know. I mean, you know, if I had to ask somebody and you know, and they, they, they've been receiving the greasy grace message that we have nowadays. Well, you know, I guess I'm saved. <laughs> Come on now. And so 56%, that's amazing to me. And meanwhile, it says while the religiously unaffiliated Americans make up about 23 to 25% of our population, man, that is about 75 to 80 million people that make up that say, you know what, I ain't interested. Now, that's amazing to me. This is a, a secular poll. This is put out by a secular poll. That tells me that, that this message is, is right on track because God wants signs and wonders. He needs the church to be that mouthpiece, to be that expression, to be that reality of his work going on. This year, living the dream is no wonder that when he said that we're going to be like those that dream, that there's people out there that are looking for answers. They're looking for a way to get some relief in their life. Amen. And it's going to have to come through the church. And it's going to have to come through the good, solid word being preached. Amen. Now, someone asked me recently, they said, you know, what's the, di what's the difference between preaching and teaching? How many of you would know the answer to that? You know, because when we're looking for a place to roost, to make a, to make a place, you know, I mean, we often tend to look at a personality and, and how we like to hear things. And, well, well preaching is simply, it's simply telling stories. I mean, you, you take a verse and then you just start telling stories and, and make those things. And, man, look, preaching is fun. I love to preach. Preaching is it's a, it's a blast because, you know, you just, and there is an anointing in preaching. How many of you know that? It says Jesus went about all the synagogues preaching, teaching, and healing. He did three things everywhere he went, preach, teach, and heal. Preach, teach, and heal. So he would preach. There's an anointing in preaching. But you understand, if you don't know how to recognize the anointing in preaching, it becomes a show. And just someone who has a gift of gab. And so preaching is primarily just exp not expounding on the word, but really just kind, of just kind of preaching along. And so it really deals with the emotion. It goes through the emotion to get to the heart. But the heart is the goal. Can you say amen? Everybody say the heart is the goal. You see, when Jesus was preaching, he was going through the emotion to get to the heart. He wasn't just trying to get the emotion. And so today we have a lot of, of, of preachers who just simply... Deal with the emotion. And boy, people making emotional decisions are not getting born again. Come on now. You got to get down in the heart. You got to get down there where I become changed in my heart. I don't want to do the things I used to do. I don't want somebody telling me, well, you know, God's grace has covered it. It does. But the fact of the matter is there's still a devil out there. And emotion can only take you so far. Now, teaching, on the other hand, is expounding on the word. It's opening and expanding the word. It's taking it, and a one plus one is two. Why is one plus one two? 
You know, and so it's, it's another form of teaching that goes mentally. It takes, a, it takes the inroad to the heart through the mind. And so it, a good mixture of both is going to serve you well. Amen? That's kind of why on Sunday mornings we do a little bit more preaching than teaching, but Wednesday nights a little bit more teaching than preaching. Are you with me? So, so the answer to the question is that, that's the best I can do is that one goes through the mind and one goes through the emotion, but the inroad needs to be the heart. Amen? And so sometimes people are like, oh, you know, I, I, really, I don't really care much about that. Then the other times, it's, it's the, you know, uh, the preaching, man. Just, you need to get wound up sometimes, amen? You need to get excited, you know? So they're both good, but they are both necessary to get to healing, amen? All right, now, how many of you remember that the Lord said that there's a purge before the surge? All right, now, what's the purge mean? It, it means that there's a purge in our old way of thinking sometimes. In our soul, we're kind of cleaning out, man. We're just, we're, we're, we're getting rid of the bad stuff and letting God just wash that away and we're taking in the good. There's a purge like that. There's purging when it comes to, you know, to people, to their mind, to their emotions. There's, sometimes we just need things to just purge out, amen? And so those are the things we're talking about. Then it, it may be putting people in the right place. They're, I don't know. I, I really don't know what it looks like. I have to live it out every day. I have to take that revelation and I have to just simply be aware, okay, is this what you're talking about, God? Yes or no? And so it's a purge, but there's a surge coming, amen? And God said it's time to prepare those who desire to be part of that surge. I don't know about you, but I fully 100% want to be part of it. When that wave of the Spirit comes, it's going to, be, it's going to bring a lot of change, amen? Amen? There's going to be burdens lifted. There's going to be lives that are going to be so expressive about what God has done. Well, it's going to just amaze those around them. And that leads us into Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. And here, Isaiah prophesied. Now, how many of you know the difference between, like we have nine gifts of the Spirit. I've been doing some mentoring with some of our young people that ask for some mentorship. And, and we've been talking about the gift of the Spirit. Like, for instance, word of wisdom how many of you know that that is foretelling? In other words, when God gives a word of wisdom to someone or to a body or to a person or to an individual or to you to give to someone else or whatever, however he decides to use that gift of wisdom, it's optional. What do you mean optional? Well, a word of wisdom means I can take it and run with it or I can just say, ah. It's optional. However, prophecy is not optional. It's telling forth. It's saying, God's saying, this is going to happen. And there ain't nothing anybody can do about it because it's my will, it's my plan, it is going to come to pass. In other words, when Jesus prophesied and he said, listen, he said, you know, they said, give us a sign. He said, look, you're not going to get but one sign, and that's the sign of the prophet Jonas, who spent three days and three nights in the belly of a whale, so shall he, the son of man, be three days and three nights in the tomb. That was prophetic. How many of you understand? It was non-negotiable. There was nothing you could do. There was no prayer going to change it. There was no desire of anybody. It was prophecy. God spoke it out. It's going to come to pass. And he did that over and over in, in Scripture. And so what we're about to read is a prophecy, all right? But it's also wisdom. It is also, do I want to be a part of this or not? And so, so as God uses his giftings and his profound to speak to generations, as he spoke it way back then, it's still speaking today. It's a prophecy, all right? Some has been fulfilled. Others are still, in other words, it's coming around again. Are you with me? And there's a generation as they, they get to a place, and then these words are not just historically given. These are prophetic words of God. And when he begins to speak it and begins to put it into, that, into the heart of the preacher or the heart of the believer, then it's something that God is planning to happen in, in the future. we got to get ready for it. Now here he says, verse 18, Behold I, Isaiah, and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. We talked about the Lord of hosts. We talk about how that's Jehovah Shabbat. And that's the Lord who fights the battles. The Lord who is the, the, he is the king, the captain of the army. Amen. But he also fights the battle. And so he needs an army. He needs a group. He needs people 
that are willing to put themselves out there to be signs and wonders. Now, in Israel was where it started, but however, these words are still anointed of God. They are still prophetic, amen? And the devil will do anything and everything he can to stop it. Are you with me? Nonetheless, the choice is ours. This is going to happen. Now, and when God begins to give us messages that help us to prepare for that, it's usually words of wisdom. Are you with me? It's foretelling. It's that what we can do to facilitate this is how we can begin to incorporate that into our daily lives so that we can be part of those, uh, that group if we choose to be. Amen? Now, the point is, if you understand what I'm saying right now, it's going to happen. Look at your neighbor and tell him it's going to happen. You understand? This is going to happen. However, I do have a will. You do have a will. You can say, ah, it's too much for me. It requires too much dedication, whatever. I mean, it could be a million things that would stand in the way. So it's really up to you. Now, there's no condemnation. There's, no, there's therefore now no condemnation. Just keep living for Jesus, amen? I mean, that's the point. Ben, just, just keep loving Jesus, keep living for God. But let me tell you something. If you want a little bit more, it's going to be there for the taking. That's the surge. That's the signs and wonders. Now, just a couple of notes there in the first part. You, as a believer, have that gift, that calling. God's people who are in covenant with him are created and called to be signs and wonders when they're gathered under proper leadership, when they're on board with what God is doing. Now, I have a definition for you here, signs, because we're about to, what we're going to do in this tonight, we're going we're gonna to teach our way. We're going to use teaching on this Wednesday night. And we're going to show you something about some word study here. All right? So Wednesday nights, we do a lot of word study. Well, here's what we're doing. The word signs, by definition, means miraculous power as a standard. How many of you know what a standard is? It's a measure, right? So what's the measure? Miraculous power? Come on now, is that what God is looking for when he said, I and the children prophesied by Isaiah, the Holy Spirit giving him word, I and the children that God has given me are for signs and wonders, for miraculous power as a standard. In other words, God says, I'm going to set the standard. You're not going to determine what's a miracle and what's not. God said, I'm going to show you what a miracle is. I'm going to set the standard and I'm going to use your life to do it. Amen. What's a wonder? Or a distinguishing mark there. What's a wonder? Got it right there on your paper. Mofate. <laughs> that sounds like a slang way of saying more faith, doesn't it? But that's how you pronounce that, mofate. Look at your name and tell them, mofate. <laughs> mofate. You need mofate. That's what you need. <laughs> that's how you pronounce that word, mofate. That literally, that is how you pronounce it, not being funny. means a display of God's glory. So a wonder is a display of God's glory, but it doesn't stop there. It has more definition. It's a reflection of his character. Amazing likeness of. How does that grab you? I, the children that God has given me, he says, are for signs and wonder. They are for miraculous power demonstrations as a standard of God, and they are an amazing likeness of Him. Now, how many of you know who God is? You know, Jehovah. He's our Father. He's all the Jehovah names that He gave, but He's also Jesus Christ. He's also the Holy Ghost. Come on now. How many of you understand that? You know, you're not confused about all that. And so, so. Here we're talking about, I've got an example of what signs and wonders look like in Jesus Christ. It's easy. Read your Bible. Those were a measure standard, right? A determinative, a standard of measure for miraculous power. How many of you would say Jesus was a great example of that? How many of you say Jesus was a great example 
of the reflection of God's character and amazing like him. Hebrews, Paul said, he was the express image of God's person. So we have a stand. We have, we, all we need to do is look at our leader, look at the Lord, look at Jesus Christ, read the words in the Bible, and you've got the standard. What does a sign and wonder look like? Jesus is life. Amen? Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come to give them life, to show them what it looks like, to give you an example of the standard of miraculous power and amazing likeness of God, and yet still human. Now we're going to move into the New Testament, because I want you to see that these things in the definition in the word study, what I did was I went and I looked at the Greek words. And I, 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 would, I, I don't want to take the time to tell you how that works, to go from Hebrew to Greek and all that. But I want to show you the words. You're going to have to trust me on this one. I, if you would like more so that you know I'm not giving you a, a, a big line here, I, I'll do that for you. But it's not going to be in the service. Amen? It's just way too lengthy. And so to get these words converted over and translated over... I found some things that were really neat. Now, I did that in the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament Greek. All right? And so I went to these words. Now, here's how it works. So the New Testament, those words, signs and wonders, would be power and glory. Everybody say power and glory. Now, remember, signs means miraculous power, right? Wonders means an amazing likeness. It means... The display of God's glory. So you see how they're, the words are easily applied the same way. So what I want you to see tonight as we conclude this message on signs and wonders and we move on to the next thing that we have coming down the road, I want you to see how it works in, in the life of a believer. In Paul's life, we're going to look at Jesus. We're going to look at what the devil did to try to disrupt that, to try to steal, kill, and destroy that. I got some things to say. So pull up for us Luke chapter 4, verse 6, first of all. Let's look at something. Now, this is the tempter, the devil. How many of you know are familiar with the story? Jesus, when he was baptized in the river Jordan, came up out of the river. God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He was led of the spirit out into the wilderness, fasted 40 days, 40 nights, and was tempted of the devil. How many of you know the story? There were three temptations. It was a temptation for the flesh to... You know, turn these stones into bread. You're hungry. It was a temptation for the eyes. You know, let me show you all of these things that I am in control of. Right? And then the last one, he was looking for the worship. He wanted Jesus to bow his knee. And then, of course, you know, you're going to take him up to the pinnacle of the temple, try to twist the words around. All right? Pride. He tried to get him with pride. He tried to get him with his eyes. He tried to get him with his flesh. He tried everything. Well, here is one of them in Luke's rendition of it. And the devil said to Jesus, to him, all power will I give thee and the glory of them. Now, how many of you can tell right there that the devil has no idea who he's talking to? He just told the biggest lie. Oh, come on now. He has no idea who he's looking at or who he's talking to. He just told the man who has all power, who created that dude, who is, come on now. How many of you know who Jesus is? Come on, can somebody help me out? You understand? He, he, the devil just said, all this power, I'll give you. And the glory. He just lied. What does that mean to you and I? He don't know who's in you. He hears what you say, and he comes to be an audience and find out if he can mess with you. But those people who understand that they are for signs and wonders, they say, no, you're not either. You know, in Colossians, and I'm going to preach this on a Sunday morning, but I'm going to give you a little preview. How many of you know in Colossians chapter chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, and you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. Now, if my life is hid in Christ, then how, why do you keep playing hide and seek with the devil? He can't find you. 
Unless you let him. Unless you don't know the standard. Here the standard's being set. The devil said, all this authority I'll give you. And the glory of them. All this. He had just showed him what's called the kingdoms of the world. You know, I mean, if you understand, that's what the world is after. I mean, grab all you can. Can all you grab and sit on it, man. It's all about me. That's the world. The world is after the stuff, after the, after the glitz and the glamour. And Jesus says, <laughs> he, said, he said, all that is delivered unto me. Now, now, that's another lie. He stole it. How did he steal it from Adam? How did he steal it from Adam and Eve? Adam had been given all authority and power on this earth. How many of you remember the dream of God was to create man that man would be and have dominion over all the earth. Isn't that what God, that was God's dream. He said, I'm going to create man and man is going to be my vessel that I am going to, I'm going to rule the earth with and have dominion. So was it given to the devil? When he said it was delivered unto me, what happened was he's trying to convince this man, Jesus, you know, that God gave it to him. Do you see what's happening here? Y'all not, y'all, you don't really care, do you? You need to know this. If you want to be a sign of the warning, you need to know this. The devil is going to come at you with every lie he can fathom and try to mess you up because that's his only weapon. He said, this has been given to me and to whomever I will give it. Boy, I could spend some time right there. I've heard preachers do that. I'm anointed to do that. I am anointed. I've got no- Listen, you ain't got nothing that God ain't gave you. And God don't just dole it out. We talked about that Sunday morning. You've got to be, you got to, you've got to prove yourself to God that you can be trusted with his anointing. <laughs> we'll leave that for another time. So here, the display, the tempter coming after Jesus And my point I wanted you to see was the devil never knows who he's talking to. Satan's attempt to deceive the the second Adam, Jesus Christ, by lying signs. The devil has no power that God has given him. He stole that power from man. Jesus is called the second Adam. We're going to see that coming up here in these next few verses. Now, Satan only has something that he's taken from man, but he doesn't have it to give to anybody. How many of you understand that? That, That's the whole point of that. And what he was after was worship. Men will worship the devil to get what they want in life. And you don't have to do that. Look at your name and tell me you don't have to do that. See, God says in in, in Deuteronomy, he said, Deuteronomy 8.18, he said, he said, listen, he said, I am the one that gives you the power to get wealth. Amen? You don't have to worry about wealth or things. How many of you believe it all belongs to God? How many of you believe the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof? Well, if you know that, then quit letting the devil convince you that ain't true. And quit going the world's way to get it. God is bringing up a people to be signs and wonders, having demonstration of miraculous power. And it's going to look like and be the glory of God. And that's the New Testament part. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I want you to go to verse, verse 41, Carly. Let's work through. <clears throat> I'm going to watch the time. We're not going to make it elongate. We're going to bring it to an end. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon. How many of you understand the sun has its own radiance? How many of you understand the moon is simply a reflection? So do you see the demonstration here? The moon is simply a reflector. The moon is simply reflecting the sun's glory. A believer is not Jesus Christ. We're simply a reflection. We're something he shines himself on and we radiate that back. That's what a sign and wonder is. It's we're like the moon. He's the sun. We're like the moon. And so so Paul, I mean, how did he know that way back then? Come on, does anybody believe the Holy Ghost had something to do with writing this? Another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. Verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, 
but raised in incorruption. Now, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in, okay, hold, don't, don't go to the next one yet. Raised in what? To reflect something. You understand, he wasn't just talking about dying physically and when you go to heaven. He's talking about when you get born again. You understand, what happens on the inside is there is a reflection now that can, that can just glorify and express God. And so, sown in dishonor. How many of you know you were dishonoring God when you weren't saved? But when you got born again, God says, raised in glory to reflect an image. Are you with me now? Come on. It is sown in weakness. But it is raised. Now remember the word glory and power are the same word as signs and wonders. Are you with me now? It's good teaching tonight. Our lives, being born again, God raised us up to bring glory. Where we were weak, he said, I'll give you power. So when somebody sees that old weak person, come on now, all of a sudden they're going to begin to see somebody maturing in the things of God. They're going to be powerful. Mm, 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 mm. That was the main verse I wanted you to see, and I wanted you to get to it from verse 41. There's plenty of great verses before all those, but I kind of started right there to keep it in context. Signs and wonders. Raised in wonders. It's all in weakness, raised in glory. I mean, I'm telling you, man. It's raised in sign to be a sign of the power of God. Let's do a couple more. Do verse 44. It is sown in the natural body, raised in a spiritual body. There's a natural body. I want to show you that I'm not joking with you. There's a natural body and there is a spiritual body. How many of you understand that's true? All right. One more, verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was a living soul. The last Adam, how many of you know who the last Adam is? Jesus and his body, the church. The last Adam was made a, hmm. Notice that that is a small s on spirit. Why? Because it's talking about you. That's right. A quickening spirit, a spirit that's alive, powerful ready to reflect who God is with their very being. See, we need to understand this. One more verse. Go to verse 46. I want to I do one more. Howbeit, that was not first, which was spiritual, but that which was natural. That's why we need to be born again. We give God our dishonorable life and receive the life of Christ. We give God our weakness, and receive his. Does that sound consistent with the Bible? Like Paul's thorn in the flesh. God, I've besought you three times about this. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Give me your weakness, I'll give you my strength. Give me your weakness, I give you my strength. Give me your dishonor, I'll give you honor. Wow. That's powerful. So we see the first was not spiritual. We were born in the flesh, and we have to learn how to do the other, how, which is why we have Bible teaching. Amen? All right, let's move on to the next one. So you see here, this just simply for signs and wonders, raised in power, raised in glory. That's signs and wonders. I'm just showing you consistently through. We're just kind of walking through the New Testament now to show you that those things in Isaiah didn't go away. The new life in Christ is to reflect, remember the glory, of the presence of God in my life. And in Hebrews chapter 2, I gave you a little, little side note there. It says that Jesus' life was to bring many sons unto glory. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. That's what Jesus came to do. So that we would know what it looks like to reflect the likeness of God. What does it look like? So all i got to do is just understand the life of Jesus Christ. 
You know, thank God he went to the cross. But on his way to the cross, he never missed a day. Come on now. On his way to the cross, he never had a, you know, he never had a, a, a bad Monday and a sad Tuesday. Come on now. I'm pushing this way over. I can tell just by looking at you and the way you're looking at me. And if we're putting this out there. It's like, well, I've been there all my life. I, I've never. Listen, it's time to get on board with being a sign and wonder. It's a choice. It's available. It's coming. It's going to happen. God is going to raise up and reflect his image in his signs and wonders. Now go to Jude chapter, or not chapter, Jude verse 24 and 25. There is no chapter. It's all one. Now unto him, watch this. How many of you know who him is? Well, you know that by the next few words. I can't keep myself from falling. If you hadn't figured that one out yet, you ain't been around long enough. Come on now. You try to do it in your own strength. (laughs) Yeah, pride comes before fall. But now unto him, Jesus, that is able, because of his life that he lived before us, He has the ability to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his. Now, what is he saying there, church? What is the Bible telling me in that that phrase? Because I'm in him. Whenever you and I are on this earth as a part of the body of Christ, and say we're in the presence of God, we're in Christ. I am there in the midst of them where any two or three are gathered. Come on, now how many of you understand some of these things starting to fit together in your theology? And so here Jude is saying that Jesus is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his, Jesus' glory. That's why Jesus said, in my That was a long silence. In my, y'all are scared. Nobody wants to get the wrong answer, man. Listen, you're not going to get a test on this. What are you going to do in his name? In my name. In my name. You see, I'm faultless because in my name. See, it's not me. It's the anointing. All I got to do is be aware of it. Learn to follow it. Learn to recognize it. Learn to let it flow. And I try to impress you with eloquent words and, and get you all stirred up in your emotions and rah, rah, rah. And we walk out of here and we go, that was great. What did he preach? I don't know, but it was good. <laughs> See, an old country guy one time, he leaned over his wife and I just heard him say, Ethel, what did he say? <laughs> Mom, you know what I just said? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and to present you faultless before. Now, is, that, is he talking about the presence of the Lord when I get to heaven? Thank you, sister. We, you with me, ain't you? You here? You on there. All right. Of his glory. What's that glory? Wonders. When a wonder, when something amazing needs to happen, when, when the power of God needs to be established. You know, the devil's not going to come to me and tell me, you know what you did back there in the third grade. You remember that girl, Catherine Danakis? You remember what happened to her? Remember, you Remember you know? <laughs> yeah, she already knows about it. She made me throw up in the classroom, man. I mean, you know, it was, like, it was nasty. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll spare you the details. With exceeding joy. If I know that is God's will, if I know that I'm called to be a sign and wonder then what devil is going to come at me? Come on now. Oh. The devil has to sit over there. Will you play the devil for me, Jim? You don't look like him, but you know. (laughs) Just stay stay right there and just just holler out my name. Hey, Rocky. See, he, he, he don't know where I'm at. And he's over there. The devil's not, not, he's over there trying to get you to, what? 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 You know, I mean, you got, no, no. That voice is unfamiliar. I don't know. I don't know that. Mm. Mm. 
He's got to get you out of the presence of God's wondrous powers. All right. All right. So we see here in your outline, the witness of Christ is that he is going to keep you from falling and he's going to present you faultless before the presence of his glory. I don't stand in the presence of God in my own. Come on now. I stand in Christ. When Paul would say things like, in Christ. 133 times in the New Testament he made that statement. In him, in whom, in Christ. 133 times. You understand? By faith, that's where I am. And he is all power. He reflected the perfect image of my father. When my life starts to not look like that, I don't stand in my own strength. Come on now. I stand in him. And there ain't no devil. Ain't no devil that's bigger than him. Not one. And if they're right about there being new levels of new devils, there still ain't one. Come on now. That's just a religious rhetoric, rhetorical thing that preachers are selling books over. Because there ain't no new ones. And even if there were, there ain't none bigger than Jesus. Come on, church. you got to get that. If you want to be a sign and wonder, you want to be used for the power and the glory of God to be seen, you got to know this. God is made known by his wisdom as God our Savior. Go to the next verse. That's verse 25. To the only wise God. Question. Paul, in Corinthians, called the devil that blinded, the, that blinded the minds of them who are seeking salvation. He called him a god, little g. Is the devil wise? He's only wise in the wisdom of the world. But we have the only wise God. Who is he? Our Savior. Be wondrous. And majesty, dominion and signs. Nobody knows what dominion is until they see it. Nobody knows what glory is until they see it. We can theologianize it, we can put it in theology and we can explain it, but until you live it, come on now, you really don't know what it is. But let me tell you this, it brings a lot of joy. And it comes from the only wise God. How many of you know why God's wisdom is greater than any doctor, lawyer, banker, preacher. Come on now. Theologian. I don't care how long you've been in school, how many degrees. You got alphabet soup behind your name. You got so many degrees. You ain't wiser than God. But people listen to that person before they listen to God. Come on now. We've had about enough of that. I don't know about you, but I've had about enough of it. It's sickening. Disgusting. We are here for signs and wonders. Let's close it out. Jamie, come on back up here. Revelation chapter 4. I want you to go to verse 8 for me, Carly. <clears throat> I think we got it. How many of you got about seven more minutes? No, wait a minute. Nine more minutes. 8.15. School's out. Oh, scratch that. No, I'm just kidding. I want you to see something here in the Revelation. How many of you understand the Revelation is giving us Revelation. <laughs> right? So it's, it's, it's opening up the, the, the unseen realm, and it's kind of giving us an idea using words to create the image. The four beasts that each of them had six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. In other words, the eternalness of God. All right? How about that? Isn't that cool? I mean, right now, I, I, you can't hear them. You can't see them. But how many of you believe the Bible is telling us the truth? All right. Verse 9. Watch this. And when those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, verse 10, the four and twenty elders fall down before him, sat upon the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns 
before the throne saying verse 11 thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things for thy pleasure remember what Isaiah said God gave them to me for signs and wonders and they are and were created. Go back to verse 10. The four and twenty elders, how many of you know who those are? They live their life on this earth. How many of you understand that? That's who they are. And in their life, because they gave God They raised the standard of signs and wonders. They did the miraculous. They did the things that amazed and were amazing. How many of you understand, you know, things that were done, the 12 apostles and and some of the prophets, Elijah. I mean, those things were so powerful and so mighty. I don't know who all the 24 are. I mean, you know, look them up, but that's not the important part of this message. The important part is these are men that had lived their life and had received crowns for what they gave to God. What their life exhibited or expressed that gave God glory, it reflected God's glory and exhibited God's power. Are you with me now? They got, you get, you, you're going to get crowns for that. I know Jody's going to have a really big one. Because she's lived with me so far, 32 years, and she got a long way to go. She ain't got rid of me yet. She ain't about to get rid of me now. But they cast those things that they had earned or that they had given, and they said, it was you. It was you. You gave me a crown that you deserve. Oh, my good God. Oh, my good God. If we could ever get preachers and teachers to just align themselves with that one more time and realize it's all about him. Come on now. You ain't got to earn these crowns. All you got to do is just let him be God. They cast their crowns before the throne and they said, verse 11, it was you. It was you. It was you that raised that standard of power. It was you that reflected yourself through us. You created us that way so you could get pleasure. How many of you understand God gets pleasure? Not out of you being sick or being beat on or being banged around or, you know, being helpless and hopeless and and struggle and all that stuff. When you have a God so big and mighty, come on now. What a God. God takes pleasure. You don't have to earn it. You just have to decide I want it. One more. Go to verse 11 of Revelation 5. Look at another revelation. I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. The beast and the elders and the number of them was a 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's pretty good many. Anybody want to do the math? <laughs> a lot of zeros. Verse 12. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive signs that were done, riches that were acquired, wisdom, strength, honor, and glory, and blessing. Then when God says, I want to bless you. When the devil told Jesus, I'll give you all of this that I built. And Jesus said, you ain't going to give me nothing. You're about to find out who owns it. Remember Sunday morning, we're joint heirs. So who owns it? (laughs) Why do we struggle to try to get the things that God says? I've already blessed you with it. 
Can I trust you with it? Will you worship for those things or will you just worship me? Oh. Verse 13. Every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I say, blessing and honor, blessing and honor. Remember old Ron Canoli? Glory and power be unto the ancient of days. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him that sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. You understand what we're doing on the earth? There's already been those before us that recognize where it came from. They were for signs and wonders, glory and power. And when they arrived in heaven, come on now, they said, oh my, it's yours. You understand, when we get there, that's what God wants is for us to just stand there and him present you, Bill, and say, look what Bill overcame. See these crowns and Bill's going to say, but this is your crown. <laughs> Verse 14, and we'll close. And the four beasts said, amen. The four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Why don't you stand up on your feet tonight? I'm here to tell you he's not done yet. I'm here to tell you, I came to tell you tonight that you're for signs and wonders. God created you that way. He said, remember now, it's prophetic, but it's also wisdom. It's also a choice. It's also something God said it's going to happen to those that want to be a part of that. I mean, does that mean I'm going to be a preacher? Does that mean I'm going to be a teacher? Does that mean I'm going to... No, what it means is you're going to live life. It may mean all that. I don't know. We, we, got, we got churches to plant. We got, we got ministries to raise up. But we got to do it right. Amen. We're not trying to get to the church normal of today. I don't want church normalcy. I, I want to be abnormal. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I want to be, ab the world says they're normal. I'm saying, no, no, no. The church needs to be abnormal. We need to see them seeing who Jesus really is. Come on now. Every one of us can do that in our, in our own way. Listen, how many of you understand? It's not the big things that impresses God. It's everything. You think it's not significant. Man, it's very significant. Why? I'll tell you why. Because he's not done yet. And he needs our faith. Now, our mission is to fulfill Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 14 was where God came looking for Adam and Eve. And they were hiding. They'd already sinned. They'd already sided in with the devil and he found out and, you know, they, you know, Adam, what you, you know, giving account, son, you first, you know, well, you know, she said, well, Eve giving account, well, the serpent said, and he looked at the devil and he said, now in your belly shall you eat dust the rest of your life. Our mission is to continue that process. The devil's under your feet. Come on now. Our mission is to make him keep eating dust. He's choking right now. And I don't say that to be funny. Because there's a, there's a brewing and he doesn't know where it's coming from. He's going up to people and trying to figure out, are you really in Christ? It's great. You, are you really? I mean, look, I, look, all you got to do is just worship me, man. You know, give, give $100 in the offering, man. And we're going you know, to give you all these formulas that's never worked and never will. And he quit listening to all that and looked at the Bible. Get wisdom from God. Come on now. God's not a get-rich-quick plan. God is a God of stewardship of teaching us of helping us of teaching us how to be strong come on now giving him our weaknesses and receiving his power giving him our failures come on now our mission is to continue that prophecy that was fulfilled when Jesus fulfilled verse 13 that prophecy the first one given with hope that this either woman is going to bruise your head and you're going to bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15, but before that, God said, you're going to eat the dust. And our mission for signs and wonders is to keep him under your feet. Jesus said, I beheld Satan's lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you power. 
to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But let me tell you something. You let him up, he'll hurt you. Come on now. Living the dream 2015 is all about preparing us not to be out there haughty and arrogant and prideful, you know, and all that, but just simply to be a believer that's ready to be used by God at any moment. Amen? It doesn't matter whether it's in Walmart, on your job. It doesn't matter what. Come on now. It's, it's when God says, go, we're going to start talking about that. Being led by the Spirit. Come on now. It's coming.